Father God, we um, we humbly bow ourselves below you, Lord. You are so, so good. There's nothing we could do without you, Father God. There's nothing good we could do without you, Father God. It is all you. It is the words that you us in us, the spirit that stirs up in us, that drives every good force we do, Father God. Without you, we are wretched. Without you, we are cursed. But because of you and your son, Jesus Christ, we are blessed to live another day, blessed to preach the love of Jesus, blessed to help those around us, blessed to, to even breathe. And because of Jesus, we're blessed that one day we get to look upon the face of Jesus in heaven in pure awe and wonder and say, holy, holy, holy. Your love absolutely wrecks me, Father God. Your love drops me to my knees. But your love picks me up and gives me the strength to keep going forward when the devil wants me to stay down. So I thank you, Father God. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Um, sorry, that second song just really... Um, really destroyed me. <laughs> um, I am happy to be back in church. We missed last week because uh, Haley gave birth to our son, Elijah. Hallelujah is right. It was a, um, it started off as a really good moment, you know, the birth of a child, and then it turned pretty scary pretty quick. Uh, Haley started hemorrhaging and um, losing more blood. Um, and so it became scary pretty quick, but by the grace of God, uh, he, he brought in the doctors with the quick hands, quick wits, and nerves of steel to do what they needed to do in order to stop the overflow of blood coming out of Haley. And so, obviously, my wife is still here, which <laughs> I am very thankful for. I don't think I could raise four children by myself. Um, so today's message, it is called the overwhelming victory of the gospel. Moses has been on this gospel kick for, a, I know he did last week. I watched online. He was on a gospel kick last week. And it's just something we've been discussing a lot is the gospel is not preached enough in church. It's not gospel centered enough. And that's something that, uh, I know Moses and I have agreed on that this church in particular really needs to get back towards to become more centered around the gospel. Uh, so the message title again, the overwhelming victory of the gospel, and that is, that's derived from Romans 8, 37, where it says, we have overwhelming victory. It is ours through Christ who loves us. And uh, in the NAS, NASB version, it actually says we overwhelmingly conquer. So we overwhelmingly conquer all the things that the devil and his world throws at us. And that's what the gospel accomplishes for anyone who would accept Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. The gospel is the very essence of God's love for us. And if you want a deeper understanding of God's love, you need to dig into the gospel. Read your Bible in search of the gospel. Not just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but Go for the gospel in every book of the Bible. It's there. So today I want to do that. I, I, I want to dig deep into the gospel. I, I hope to help further the believer's understanding of the gospel and Jesus' love. But I also want, you know, hope that if there's anybody who hasn't accepted Jesus yet, that, that they would take that choice and run with it and run into the arms of the Father. So... We're going to jump through two stories today to do just that. And I want to start in the book of Hosea, chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Now, Hosea took place uh, 750 years before Jesus. So before the gospel was ever lived out, it was shown in the Old Testament. In Luke 24, Jesus declares to his disciples... I am through all the scripture. He teaches his disciples how to find him 
in all of the Old Testament books. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to open up Hosea, uh, page 532, and we're going to find Jesus. Everybody there? No, I'll give you all some time. Okay. All right. So, short reading. Hosea 1, 2 through 3. When the Lord first began speaking to Israel through his, through Hosea, he said to him, go and marry a prostitute so that some of her children will be conceived in prostitution. This will illustrate how Israel has acted like a prostitute by turning against the Lord and worshiping other gods. So Hosea married Gomer, the daughter of Deblame, and she became pregnant and gave Hosea a son. Now jump over real quick, chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. Then the Lord said to me, go and love your wife again, even though she commits adultery with another lover. This will illustrate that the Lord still loves Israel, even though the people have turned to other gods and love to worship them. So I bought her back for 15 pieces of silver and five bushels of barley and a measure of wine. So there's a few points here, and um, the biggest and most obvious is Hosea has to marry a prostitute, and that's um, quite an odd command to give a prophet of the Lord, a man of God, has to go and marry a prostitute. That's um, quite strange. (laughs) So chapter 1, Hosea obeys his father, and he marries his prostitute, and she gives birth to three children. And then we jump to chapter 3. God says, go and love your wife again. So Hosea is back in prostitution. Hosea has abandoned the grace. I'm sorry, Gomer, forgive me. Gomer is back in prostitution. Gomer has abandoned the grace that Hosea has shown her. And God says, go get her back. Go love the prostitute that you had to love once before and is now back being a prostitute. Go love her again. And I remember as a kid, not as a kid, but as a teenager, reading this story, and I'm it's like, what? Why in the world would I want to go get her back? Why would I marry a prostitute in the first place? And then when she runs back to being a hooker, why would I go marry her again? More specifically, God says, go love her again. So why? Because Jesus did it. Because that's what Jesus has done for us, is it not? Have we not run off with our sin time and time again? Were we not in sin to start with before we came to the Lord and we came to the Lord and we accepted the grace of Jesus and then a lot of us turned our backs and went right back into prostitution? We did it, and God did what Hosea has to do. He took us back. He didn't just take us back. It says he paid the price. That's what Jesus did. Jesus paid the price. And this story of Hosea and Gomer, it's not a story about how we should forgive one another no matter what the cost. It's a story about how Jesus forgave us no matter the cost. No matter what we do, Jesus forgives us. And that's something I've personally had to cling on to. John 3.16 says that God gave his only begotten son so that whosoever would accept him have eternal life. That's whosoever. So no matter what you have done, whoever you are, no matter your sin, Jesus chose you. Jesus went to the cross for you. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what I've done. See, Moses asked me months ago if I was ready to preach, and I said, absolutely. And then months went by, and he still hadn't asked me to preach. And then a few weeks ago, he says, are you ready? I said, I was ready three months ago. And so for three months now, the devil's been telling me you can't do it. You shouldn't do it. Who are you? You can't line up there. You can't stand up and talk about Jesus. Who are you to talk about Jesus? Do you know who you're talking to down there? Did y'all know there's a woman in this church 
I'm sure some of my facts are a little wrong because it's been years since I heard the story. She, she lived in like mud huts in the desert of like New Mexico preaching Jesus to little children. How do I preach to that woman? How do I preach to the American Mother Teresa? Who am I to preach to Mother Teresa? I'm a nobody. I got a long list of people who could stand up here and tell you why I shouldn't be up here. And I'm at the front of the list. I'm at the very front of that line. I can give you example after example of why I should not be up here. And when I'm going at it with the devil and I'm letting him beat me down, and this is a real story, this happened. Uh, I, I, I was trying to go through this sermon and I'd open it and, and then the devil would start talking and I'd set it down and I'd walk away. I wouldn't look at it. And then one day, God says, what are you doing? I said, I can't do it, Lord. How do I preach to Mother Teresa? He said, Michael, you know your sins. I know your sins. And you know their good deeds, but I know their bad sins, their bad deeds. I know the sins that they have. That's not for you to know. Just know that I've called them there. I've called you here. Stand up and do your job. And then he told me this morning, as I was going at it again, he said, Michael, don't forget the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, who also. And I said, God, it doesn't say who also. He said, it might as well. Look at the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, who was also with you while you were driving drunk. Our Father who art in heaven, who was also with you when you kept buying more shots. Our Father who art in heaven, who also was with you every time you lit the cigarette. Our Father in heaven, who also was with you. Every single time you sat at the foot of your bed crying. Crying. <laughs> crying about the things you've done crying about the ones who have abandoned you crying about anything and everything this world has thrown at you our father who art in heaven is also by our side protecting and loving us that's the gospel that's what Jesus did on the cross he closed that gap the chasm that separated us from God. Jesus closed that gap on the cross. So whatever sins you've committed, Gomer, abandon those sins and return to your Savior. Return to your Hosea, your Jesus, the one who paid the price to buy you back from sin, sin that you chose willingly. Jesus loves you just as Jesus loves me. Just as Hosea had to love Gomer, Jesus has to love us. It's who he is. It's the essence of who he is. He hasn't chosen to condemn you or shame you. That guilt that we all walk around with, we don't have to anymore. Jesus on the cross is not your fault. Okay? Jesus on the cross is not your fault. Jesus on the cross is your freedom. Freedom from the guilt and the shame brought on by living like Gomer. Jesus chose to pay the price that sin put on us. He chose to buy you back, so come back. Let go and forgive yourself. Forgive your own past and be born again into God's kingdom. He wants you. Now, another point of this story that Jesus showed to me just a couple of days ago, who went to who first? Did Gomer go seeking Hosea in either instance when she was a prostitute in chapter 1 or when she went back to prostitution in chapter 3? No. Hosea went to Gomer. Jesus came to you. Jesus came to me. Before we chose Jesus and even after we chose Jesus and then chose sin, he still came to us. Jesus is always coming to us. Every day he shows up at our door and says, let me in. We have to let him in. It is a choice for the Christian every single day to let Jesus in. Now, moving on to the actual four books of the gospel, 
I want to go to uh, Luke 9, verses 28 through 44. So a good deal of reading. Absolutely. Appreciate it, Carl. Mine's not up. Now, this is one of the instances where, so obviously it's the gospel, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But this is one of them stories where it's kind of like the gospel within the gospel. It's a cool, it's two stories built into one reading. And it's something that's been uh, really just nagging and nagging at me the last month or so. So give me a holler when everyone's there. Holler. All right. So verse 28 of Luke 9. About eight days later, Jesus took Peter, John, and James up on a mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was transformed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared and began talking with Jesus. They were glorious to see, and they were speaking about his exodus from this world, which was about to be fulfilled in Jerusalem. Peter and the others had fallen asleep. And when they woke up, they saw Jesus' glory and the two men standing with him. As Moses and Elijah were starting to leave, Peter, not even knowing what he was saying, blurted out, Master, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let's make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But even as he was saying this, a cloud overshadowed them, and terror gripped them as a cloud covered them. Then a voice from the cloud said, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. When the voice finished, Jesus was there alone. They didn't tell anyone at that time what they had seen. Moving on to verse 37. The next day after they had come down a mountain, a large crowd met Jesus. A man in the crowd called out to him, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, my only child. An evil spirit keeps seizing him, making him scream. It throws him into convulsions so that he foams at the mouth. It batters him, and he hardly ever leaves him alone. I begged your disciples to cast out the spirit, but they couldn't do it. Jesus said, you faithless and corrupt people, how long must I be with you and put up with you? Then he said to the man, bring your son here. As the boy came forward, the demon knocked him to the ground and threw him into violent convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the evil spirit and healed the boy. Then he gave him back to the father. Awe gripped the people as they saw this majestic display of God's power. And while everyone was marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, Listen to me and remember what I say. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of the enemy. All right, so... I was always um, mesmerized by the first part of this story, the transfiguration. I always thought that was the coolest thing in the world. It's actually why I chose, and Haley didn't choose, but I chose the name Elijah for our baby um, because of this story. Uh, So I want to go back to the mountain. Let's go start with the mountain and the transfiguration. So Jesus brings his three closest friends up this mountain, and they have the experience of a lifetime. Moses shows up. Elijah shows up, and Jesus starts glowing. It's almost like a party on the mountaintop for these three young Jewish men. And I've had some really amazing mountaintop experiences in my life here in church, but I've certainly never had something like that happen. I wish I would, but I pray for it all the time. I really do, but God hasn't answered that prayer just yet. But so Moses and Elijah, they're discussing the coming victory of the cross with Jesus. And the disciples are asleep. They wake up and are completely taken back, as would all of us be, I imagine. Peter, being Peter and never knowing when to just be quiet, he shouts, let's build shelter so we can stay here on the mountain. Let's stay here with Moses and Elijah and you, Jesus, with your cool new face. But even as Peter's saying this, God says, stop. He comes over top of them as a magnificent cloud and says, this man here is my chosen one, my son. Listen to him. Moses and Elijah disappear, and only Jesus remains. Only Jesus. 
So let's break that down. Moses is the law. Moses represents the law, and Elijah represents the knowledge of the prophets. And it's a magnificent experience, I'm sure, especially if you're loudmouth Peter and overzealous brothers James and John being with Jesus, Moses, and Elijah is a moment you would never forget. But the moment Peter thinks they should remain on the mountain with the law and knowledge, God shows up and says, no, 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 no. You don't stay with the law. You don't stay with the knowledge. You don't worship the law. You don't worship the knowledge. Only Jesus. You only worship Jesus. Follow Jesus. Do as Jesus says. Listen to him was the command of God on the mountain. It was not listen to Moses. It was not listen to Elijah. It was listen to Jesus. Do as Jesus does. The law doesn't free us. We, we watched a video in our Bible group um, a couple of Tuesdays ago, and they were talking about the law. And some guy gave an illustration. He said, the law is like a mirror. It's simply to reflect how much sin we actually have and how we need Jesus. And then he said, when you look in a mirror and you see something stuck in your teeth, do you break the mirror and use one of the shards of glass to pick out your tooth? No, you don't. You go get a toothpick, right? So we can't use the law to free us. We cannot use the law to separate us from sin. The law simply points out our sin, and it points out that we need Jesus to remove that speck, the log in our own eyes. We need Jesus. We don't cling to our own works, and we don't cling to our own understanding. We, the church, cling to Jesus, Without Jesus, we're nothing. And our Sunday morning gatherings can be magnificent. We can have wonderful mountaintop experiences, church conventions, thousands of Christians all singing together. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is to, is to come is a wonderful experience. It's an enthralling experience. In fact, one of the greatest experiences I've ever had in the Christian church I was in Chicago at a conference with Moses and a few other members of the church. And there's two or 3,000 other Christians, preachers and worship leaders. And right as the band, the vertical worship band, actually the last band that we listened to today, right as they started to sing, all the power in the building got cut. There was no sound coming from the band. So obviously the band stopped and they look around, but almost as if the Spirit of God moved down upon everybody in that room with one voice, two or 3,000 Christians started singing out to the Lord. No instruments, no band, no nothing, just one voice praising our Heavenly Father. And it was a wonderful experience. But it wasn't an experience we could stay in. It was a mountaintop experience that we had to leave. We couldn't stay there. We had to exit the mountain. And there's a reason. And the reason is found at the bottom of the mountain. The reason we follow Jesus, the reason God says, listen to Jesus, and then Jesus exits the mountain. We have to follow him. The reason's at the bottom in the valley of the mountain. The next day, there is a man bringing his tormented son to Jesus. What happens if Jesus stays on the mountain? What happens if Peter gets his wish and they build tabernacles and just live on the mountain? Who's going to free the boy? It's not the disciples. They couldn't do it. Jesus had to exit the mountain because he knew there was a little boy at the bottom of the mountain and a father, and a father who was completely wrecked because every single day his little boy is being thrown around like a rag doll. Jesus left the mountain, and so must we. We must leave the mountain. We are surrounded by sons and daughters who are tormented every day by evil. Sons and daughters that God formed himself, who are being destroyed by the devil's little minions but we're so focused on our mountaintop experiences and staying on the mountain, and we, we keep these mountaintop experiences for ourselves that we never come down the mountain and let them know what's going on on the mountain. We enter the valley and shut up. 
Instead of entering the valley and speaking up as Jesus does, Jesus said, bring the boy to me. We are supposed to bring these tormented souls to Jesus. The disciples couldn't do it. And Jesus gives an answer for that later on. He says, you needed to pray and fast more to have that kind of power, which means we can step up and cast out these demons in the name of Jesus. But we got to bring these children to Jesus. We got to come down the mountain and bring the boy to Jesus. God's had enough of his church staying silent. I know he's had enough. This is what he put on me. These are not my words because I'm not any better at going down the mountain and opening my mouth in public. I'm just as silent as the majority of the church, so I know God's had enough because he told me so. He wants us to exit the mountain and reach the boy who's possessed by demons. And in case you weren't sure, we used to be that boy. We weren't the disciples at the bottom of the mountain. We weren't the religious leaders. We weren't even the father. We were the boy. We were all once upon a time ruled by sin. And Jesus left heaven. That is the story of the gospel. Jesus came down his heavenly mountain into our valley and took on a cross that we deserved. And he freed us from sin. That's the gospel. That's the overwhelming victory of the gospel. Had Jesus never left heaven, we would never get in. Had Jesus never left heaven, we'd never leave hell. We'd be condemned for all eternity, but he did come down. And because some faithful disciple of Jesus opened their mouth and spoke to each and every one of you and said, hey, by the way, there's this God-man who loved you so much he gave up being God to become man, to die so that he could become God again and forgive you of your sins so that you might one day join him in heaven. Because someone came down their mountain and told you that, here we are, sitting in a church, worshiping the Heavenly Father who created us. He left heaven to save thousands and millions of gomers. He didn't just leave to save the spotless little lambs who do everything mommy and daddy says. He left heaven for the gomer laying on her back for some money. That's who he left heaven for. Now, God's love, if you haven't picked up on it yet, is a very, very strange love. And I've said it before, our God is a strange God. And I just want to go through some examples. In John 11, Lazarus, who is a good friend of Jesus, he dies. And with God's strange love, instead of just healing Lazarus and raising him from the grave, he cried with Lazarus' sisters and all the other people crying. Jesus broke down and wept. To me, that's strange. In Luke 23, 34, Jesus is on the cross, and he's moments away from death. And all the things he could do in that instance, like, for example, stop dying, get off the cross, go back to heaven, forget all of us. He cries out, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That's strange. If you ask me, that's a strange showing of love. Because like I said, he could jump off the cross and go back to heaven. In Mark 9, 21, is, uh, it's actually the, another, ex- another uh, version of this story of Jesus on the mountain and then Jesus in the valley. Mark 9, 21 is the transfiguration and the demon-possessed boy, but it gives a couple more details. And uh, in there, in verse 21, Jesus says to the Father, How long has this been happening? As if the dad really wants to answer that question. What do you mean, how long has this been happening? How about you just save him? Jesus, just heal him. Why are you asking me this? Why do I have to face all the pain that I've lived through through my little boy's entire life? Why? That's strange. If you ask me, that's strange of Jesus to ask him. 
But I'll tell you why Jesus asks him. Because every single day this boy has been physically tormented. The father has been emotionally and mentally and spiritually tormented. And Jesus wants the father to cry out to him. Face the pain that he's gone through and cry out. And as the father answers Jesus, undoubtedly, Jesus has pure grace and love and and compassion in his eyes. The father can see that Jesus cares. In Psalms 56, 8, it tells us that God catches every tear in a bottle that we cry. Jesus cried at the tomb with Lazarus because Jesus' friends were crying. Jesus weeps with his friends. God weeps with us. Jesus pled for our forgiveness on the cross because he so desperately wants us to join him in heaven. Think about how amazing heaven is going to be. Think about the paradise of heaven. Something Jesus created and existed in since the beginning of time. But instead of being satisfied with what is essentially paradise. Jesus says, it's not enough. Jesus said, it's not enough. I need my men and women whom I created and formed in their mother's wombs to be with me. Heaven wasn't enough for Jesus. He needed us with him. And maybe that rattles some feathers. I don't know. Ruffle some feathers. Either way, it's the truth. Jesus chose to come down from heaven because he wanted us to come up to heaven. He wanted us in heaven with him. And I don't know about you, but for me, that fills me with joy. So Jesus says, tell me how long your precious little boy has been thrown around like a rag doll. Because God wants us to holler out to him. Jesus, it's going on forever, year after year after year after year. My precious son, my precious daughter is being tormented by the devil. I want him or her to come back to you, Lord Jesus. He wants us to cry out because he wants to answer your prayers. He wants to release us. He wants to release our sons and daughters. Church, there are mothers and fathers surrounding you every single day who have their own sons and daughters. In fact, there are mothers and daughters, mothers and fathers in this church, your own Christian brothers and sisters who have sons and daughters that they are crying They cry over night after night because their little baby, who they used to sing heavenly praises over, their little baby, who they used to pray over every night, has run from Jesus. Your brothers and sisters are mothers and fathers with tormented little boys and little girls, and we won't do a thing about it. This is what Jesus has laid on my heart. That we need to come down our mountain and help our brothers and sisters who have sons and daughters who so desperately want their child to be released. We have to come down and bring those sons and daughters to Jesus. Your own brothers and sisters are crying out, please, Lord, please. Save my child. Who are we to come into these moments where we know we're saved and never step up and lead someone to the grace that is Jesus? Who are we to get in the way of that? We're supposed to carry the message to the ends of the earth, to all the nations, to all the neighbors. Maybe you can't go to Israel. Maybe you can't go to Iraq and preach to Muslim babies. Maybe you can't go to the deserts of New Mexico and live in a mud hut. But you can go to your neighbors who don't know Jesus. Go to your neighbors who know Jesus, but their kids don't. 
Most of you are significantly older than I, and most of you have children my age. Who am I not to stand next to my peers and say, Jesus loves you? It's pretty easy to do it up here, as nervous as it makes me to come up here. It's an easy thing to tell a church full of God worshipers that God loves you. It's not easy to walk into the valley of the shadow of death and tell a bunch of tormented souls God loves you because they hate God. But so did we. Even us who were raised in the church, even us who knew Jesus from the beginning, we abandoned Jesus. But just as Hosea returned to Gomer, so Jesus returned to us and brought us back in to his love and his grace. So who are we to get in the way of other children who could find Jesus? It's up to us, church. God commissioned us. He sent Jesus for 33 years and then took him back so that we would step up and give the same message that Jesus gave, so that the three years that Jesus so perfectly lived out the gospel, we could take at least one moment to share said gospel. God told me the other day, he said, Michael, you can read the Bible in a year all you want. If you don't take one second to listen to me, it will do you no good. We can study the scriptures all we want, but until we take one second and listen to the command of Jesus, go and make disciples of all the nations, it will do us no good. We have to step forward, church. This is what Moses has been screaming for 10 years, and I'm not an evangelist like Moses. I don't have that spirit. He is okay with walking up to a complete stranger and saying, brother, Jesus loves you. I don't have that spirit, and based off the fact that the majority of this church has never done that, I'd say most of us don't have the evangelistic spirit either. But that doesn't mean we can't step up with the spirit of God. Moses has an evangelistic spirit because God gave him that spirit, just as he can give us that spirit. We can come off our mountains and boldly proclaim, Jesus loves you, brother. Jesus loves you, daughter. Let go of your shame. I'm not here to condemn you. Jesus didn't show up to condemn anyone. He showed up to free the world from the devil. God so loved the world. God has a case of the so loves, just as a parent is so in love with their child. God has a case of the so loves for each and every one of us and everyone around us uh, growing up. My mother had the case of the so loves, and unfortunately, she showed it at the baseball games. My mother doesn't know the first thing about baseball, but that didn't stop her from screaming as loud as possible and embarrassing every single one of us night after night because she had the case of the so loves. We got a hit. She so loved us that she would scream at the top of her lungs and let us know how proud she was of that. God has a case, whoa, hello. God has a case of the so loves, and even when the devil steps in to cut our microphones, God provides another one. God loves every single one of us. And I believe everyone in here is, in fact, already a believer. But we're recording online, so maybe one day... Someone who doesn't believe in Jesus and accept Jesus will see it. Maybe one day somebody will hear this message and say, I'm tired of living like Gomer. I'm tired of it. I am so thankful that Jesus existed because now I can run to him. Every single one of us had that moment at some point in our lives, and it's our job to help provide that moment for other Gomers in this world. One last story, real quick. There's this lawyer talking to Jesus, a little know-it-all lawyer who knows nothing insignificant. And he says, in reference to the law, Jesus, who is my neighbor? Because Jesus said, love your neighbor. And the guy, the guy says, who is my neighbor? 
So Jesus gives this outrageous story about how there is a man half dead on the side of the road, beaten and robbed. That's us. That was us. We were the half dead souls living in this world, beaten down by the devil. And a priest walks by and goes to the other side of the road and keeps going. That's the law. In case you guys didn't know, that's the law. The law can't save us. And then another man, a Levite, I believe, he does the same thing. He walks on by. And then a Samaritan shows up, helps the guy, brings him to a motel, pays his wages. He helps fix the guy up, clean him up a bit, tells the innkeeper, take care of him. If he uses up more than I've spent, I'll give it back. And at the end of the story, Jesus says, so, Mr. Lawyer, who proved to be a neighbor? The answer is the Samaritan. Jesus says, yes, now go as he did. Go do as he did. Go be a neighbor. Jesus, when he says, love your neighbors, he wants us to be a neighbor. By being a neighbor, we will love our neighbor. By being a neighbor, we will come down our mountain and love all the gomers and tormented little boys in this world and show them the love of Jesus. That is what he wants from us. That is how we reach the ends of the world with the love of Jesus. The next time you're faced with that situation where do I speak or do I not, the answer is yes, you always preach the good news of Jesus. But when you don't have the courage to do so, tell God. Tell him, Father, I I can't do this. I don't have the courage to actually do this. Lord, please give me the strength to speak on your behalf, and he will. The Holy Spirit will give you the words to speak. The Lord will control your tongue and give you everything you need to speak to that said person. It's time we stop playing church and started being the church. It's time that we came down our mountaintop and reached all the tormented souls in the valley. It's time, church. And we're going to pray. We're going to talk about offering. We're going to give. And we're going to worship Jesus again. And Brother Joe is going to come up and he's going to talk about the announcements. And then um, I don't know that there's food prepared because Herb and Jen aren't here today. We got food. All right. Carl says we got food. So we're going to go out front. We're going to fellowship with one another. We're going to enjoy our time on the mountain with one another. We're going to love each other, encourage each other, speak each other up, build each other up. And when it's all said and done, we're going to walk out the front door and come down the proverbial mountain into the valley of the shadow of death where there are tormented little boys and girls. And we are going to preach Jesus. We have to. It's time we stop being afraid of sharing Jesus because that's all it is. It's a fear of sharing Jesus. And it is the dumbest fear in the world. I don't have an eloquent way of saying that. It's just the dumbest fear we could possibly have to share Jesus. Trust in the Lord to speak through you, and he will undoubtedly speak through you. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray to our Heavenly Father for courage and strength and knowledge on what to do in those situations. Father God, I am I'm taken back by your goodness. I'm taken back by the gospel that Jesus loved us so much he willingly died for us. He died for me personally. I love that. There's nothing I can do that's good without that. I cling to that, Father. And I pray that everyone who hears this message would cling to that. And I pray every church in America right now with the turmoil that we're in would cling to the love of Jesus. 
that we could show the world the love of Jesus. Your good word says that they will know we are your children based off of how we love one another. We must cling to the love of Jesus if we ever want to reach the ones around us. Father, give us that strength. Give us that courage. Give us the knowledge. Give us the words to speak in those moments. Too many moments have gone by where these tormented boys and girls never hear your word because so many of us are too afraid to speak. I personally, Lord, I live next to a motel full of real live gomers, real hookers, real meth heads and crack heads, dope users, dope dealers. I live next to pimps and hookers, Lord. I live in the valley, Father. Give me the strength to speak to those people, Father God. Give me the strength to show the love of Jesus. And please, Lord, give this church the strength to step up and reach the people in the valley. Help us, Father God. We can't do it without your goodness, without your grace, without your love. We can't do it, Lord. We ask that your Holy Spirit would fill this room and fill these hearts. Move through us. Ignite a new passion in this church and lead us down the mountain. As Jesus goes down the mountain, so shall we. So shall we reach the tormented little boys and heal the broken hearts of the mothers and fathers. Thank you, Father God, for giving us another day, another chance to reach the broken world. Thank you, Father God, for giving us another chance to come together as believers in your house. Thank you, Father God, for the gospel, the victory of the gospel is ours through Jesus. We thank you, Father God. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. We're going to keep our heads bowed. We're going to pray about offering. As all of you know, here at Revolution, we don't just throw change in the bucket, nor do we write big fat checks in hopes that God might bless us. We talk to our Heavenly Father and we ask Him, Father, what does... What does generosity look like for me personally? How can I give, Lord? You have given me everything. Nothing is mine. It all belongs to you, Father God. So what do I give? How do I give? What looks like generosity for me, Father God? Lord, we, um, that's what we pray, Father. What does generosity look like for each and every one of us as we decide in our hearts with joy about being able to give to your church, that your church would be able to give to those around us who are in need.